A week after my first failed attempt to catch the comet with a weird name, C-2022 E3 ZTF, the one with the green tail, I set out again for a new attempt. I checked the Stellarium app on my phone to see where it would be this moonlit night. Clouds were supposed to be covering the sky later in the night, and the moon would outshine part of the night sky, so the circumstances were far from perfect. Still, what better way to spend a Saturday night than to try and catch a green smudge with my old DSLR? I charged the batteries and changed the lens to a zoom lens I bought from a friend. The goal was not to take the perfect picture or make the perfect time lapse, the goal was to catch the comet before it was too late. There are a bunch of settings to remember when shooting a time lapse on a dark night. One thing to remember is to set the focus to manual. Before I leave, I always prepare the settings somewhat. It's better to have done that at home, where you can actually see what you're doing instead of doing it all from scratch, without gloves in the cold winter nights with only the light from your phone. I usually aim for a shutter speed set to 20 seconds or so. Depending on how much you zoom and how long or short shutter speed you use, the stars can go from looking like bright dots to looking like lines in the sky. To make a smooth time-lapse with my old Canon EOS 600D I need an intervalometer connected to the camera, or a nice little program like Magic Lantern. If I for example would choose a shutter speed of 20 seconds, I would set Magic Lantern to snap a picture every 23 seconds or so, to give the camera time to do whatever it does between shots. Another important thing for me is shooting in RAW, which is far better in editing than the compressed JPEG formats. In the audio world, the comparison would be to record in WAVE or MP3. The aperture I set to the lowest value I can, to let more light in. I chose my friend's backyard as a location to shoot the time-lapse. Mostly because he has a tiny house where I could hang out while letting the camera do all the work for me. I like when machines work for me. Even though I had prepared some settings back home, I spent about 20 minutes changing them and also trying to find the comet. I couldn't see it, but with the help of the Stellarium app and some trial and error, I eventually zoomed in on the green little smudge. Conditions were all but great. The moon was outshining the stars around it and a layer of clouds passed by over me. It was supposed to get cloudy that night and I was lucky. The clouds went away just as I was done setting the camera up. I managed to get the time-lapse done and right at the end of it the clouds came back and covered the sky for the rest of the weekend. All the while the camera did the work for me, I was sitting in the tiny house playing old punk songs on my old bass. Back when I first tried to capture the night sky, I set my ISO to the lowest value, because I didn't like grain. That was a mistake. By the time I understood that ISO will bring out the Milky Way for me, I had already started to like grain, and had also gone from trying to make everything clean in the editing, to instead try to bring out more detail. As strange as it sounds, the details can often be found in the graininess. I don't understand how a frost-covered lens can still take decent pictures. When editing a time-lapse, all I really do is find one photo which will represent all the others, and I edit that one. Editing is mostly just moving all the sliders left and right until it looks nice. I like to get the shadows up in my photos. You can find interesting things hidden in the dark parts. A problem I have with my lenses is chromatic aberration, which makes some edges purple and others green. It takes some messing around with the settings to solve the problem. If you use too much noise reduction, the fainter stars will disappear. When I'm done editing, I copy the edits from the picture I've worked on and paste it to the rest of them. Scrolling through the images, I can already see kind of what the timelapse will look like. After this, I save all photos as JPEGs with just a few clicks. A while later I open up Adobe Premiere and import the images as an image sequence. This will have the same image size as the images themselves, and I want to make a 1080p HD movie, so I create a new sequence and drag the image sequence into it. I made two different sequences, where one has the comet fixed in the middle of the screen. I started off with zooming in and centering the comet in the middle of the screen, and set keyframes at the beginning and the end. This was when I first saw clearly that the comet wasn't moving with the stars. Because of how the Earth rotates, it wasn't enough with the two keyframes to keep the comet in the middle of the screen. With the help of a grid, I set a few more keyframes to keep the comet in place. I had started the time-lapse shooting at 1.01am and 20 minutes later I had 69 pictures. 
With a frame rate of 30 frames per second, I had just over 2 seconds of footage. That's not much. The least I could do was to double it by letting it play at half the speed. Finally, this is the version with the comet in the middle of the screen. It's not my greatest piece of work, but I think it shows that you can catch a comet with equipment not really made for it and under really crappy conditions. And this is the version from the very same frames where you can see the comet move from the top to the bottom of the screen.